All right, so today we're going to be studying about uh, Gaudi and Spes. Um, I will walk over here and click a little. Why don't you help me out? No, I'm back. I'm back. So, basically, what I do is just go over a quick little outline of uh, what the what the Constitution really goes into. It's a huge document. There's no two questions about that one. Um, so, starts out really talks about church and man's calling, split up into two parts. Church and man's calling is the first part, and then special problems of urgency, which is the second part. First part basically takes dignity of the human being and grows it. Takes the individual and next thing you know just keeps adding to it, to it, to it, to it. Eventually you have the entire person from human dignity all the way up to the church, talk, the church talking about itself. Keeps adding on to it. From that point on, uh, we'll go into the, it goes into the special problems. Takes everything that we've learned about human dignity and the church and applies it. So in certain, some of the problems that goes over is marriage and family life, which we'll hear more about in a little while. Uh, the, proper, the proper development of culture, and then of course, the economics and social life. So many of those issues that we keep hearing about today. You know, we all know them, we know the issues, we know the problems. Church tried to give us an idea of how to, how to go about solving them. Now we just gotta get the rest of the world to listen. Okay. So, um, next, uh, next part of the whole part of it goes into the political community. And it starts out with the true political community, which we'll go about a little bit, and then also gets into how the, the government and political nature should work with, within the uh, structure of, of humanity. And always keeping in mind human dignity. Human dignity is always number one whenever the church talks. And eventually now we take everything we have now gone from simple, well, simple man, if you will, built it up, and now we've gone, bring it up to the war, strife, peace. How to bring that whole, how to bring all that together. So, it's a huge document. It covers tons and tons of stuff. No two questions about it. There is 37,000 words, you can cover a lot of stuff. So therefore, it really did a wonderful job of that. So that's the basic framework from which uh, that, that we're gonna be building, we're gonna be building from. So got, uh, that's our basic setup of, the, of that. We'll be uh, going through it in the same uh, pathway as the church did, only we'll be using Dr. Mess's um, um, pamphlet is the uh, guide. So, I believe we, I'm not sure, I think we have uh, the pamphlets the on the table over there. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, if anybody can go and get, uh, grab some. I'll, I'll bring them over. Yep, yeah. Yeah, that'll work. So, a few weeks ago, Father Moises asked me if I could do the talk on Gaudi Vitz Spes. And uh, it translated into English, that means uh, the hope and joys. And I told him that I certainly hope that it would be enlightening to all of us in attendance. So, now, as I said, 37,000 words. You can, uh, you can see two things. Uh, first, even by the church standards, this is a huge document to go over. And second, it just covers tons of things, like we said. Now, our particular problem right here is what exactly you cover? You have a document that covers so many things, all the major, deepest questions of mankind. Who am I? What is my purpose? And then add more and more until you bring it to the ultimate world, the issues of war and strife, and how to go about solving the issues. Obviously not solving the issues themselves, because that would take far more than 37,000 words, but that isn't the church's goal here. It's simply to how to go about solving the issues while at the same time keeping man as man, uh, human dignity as the center point of the entire uh, point. That is the church in the modern world. So it's no wonder that it takes 37,000 words to cover this document. It took two committees to write it up. And 
Now, looking at the entire Constitution, how do we get the most out of it? We could go paragraph by paragraph, but besides being rather boring, it really doesn't give us a practical way of putting it into use. So, Father has made available to us the booklet, Lay Spirituality, A Heritage of the Whole Church by Dr. Jose de Mesa. The introduction to the is a stark reminder of days gone by. Much of my self-teaching years ago, many, many years ago, came from a pre-Vatican II book. As a matter of fact, from my grandfather's high school study book. I learned about the Eucharist and all the many rules for living a good Catholic life. I mean, absolutely no disrespect to him, but he and I were reading this book at about the same age, but my world was vastly different than his. I did learn the rules. As far as our individual spirituality, back before Vatican II, Dr. Mesa says the following. Lay spirituality did not have an identity of its own. It was more like a watered-down version of the monastic way of being Christian. That lay spirituality considered, consisted of people imitating the religious. Everyone was trying to be sister men. <laughs> so, however, the very setting in which they found themselves, the secular world, is really wasn't considered a valid place to do that type of spiritual life. Inasmuch this world was full of temptation and evil influence. Now the world was a place and a phase of trial as they looked upon it. They, we were looking forward to the one true destination, which was heaven. Now per, upon hearing this, the first thing that came to my mind was Plato. Of course, I'm a geek. <laughs> <laughs> So, let's see if, in, if uh, Plato, Plato's word sounds familiar. Plato, he was born in the 5th century BC, had written about the concept of pre-existent souls in a state of perfection prior to taking on the mortal body on earth. When the soul is released from the prison of the body, it ascends back to the heavenly realm, where it is reunited with the realm of ideas. The soul in place of perfection before it reaches the body. One has to assume, therefore, that the body is less than perfection, particularly mine. Well, we intellectually know better than this, but we certainly seem to, uh, it seems to reflect what we know around us. There is doubt no way of really getting rid of the world. Can't, we, the only way of really promoting the spiritual life is to uh, create enclaves and little non-rural non places like monasteries and religious organizations. And little by little, these enclaves just grew and grew through our concerted action. Now, in the case of Christianity, we see in the very early heresies, such as Marcionism. Marcion was born about 85 and lived to about 160. He was actually a merchant, a merchant and shipper, and he was consecrated a bishop in, the, in uh, Sinop, which is in the north side of Turkey, uh, along the Black Sea. He looked at the Bible and noted that there was differences between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. So he did what any religious person would do, throw out the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> didn't work, I sure didn't agree with him. So, all right. So, uh, then, a little bit later on, there was the Gnostics. Gnosticism is an extreme form of dualism. Everything thought of in the spiritual realm is good, while everything in the earthly realm is bad. Yeah, even now. From everything we see around us, we can sometimes understand how this thinking, can, that the world is evil, can be determined. After all, we are told that God is good, surpasses our highest thoughts and expectations. Heaven is for a holy, is for the holy, and unity with God, and God is in heaven. In the world, we see people maiming and killing at marathons, nuclear bombs ready to extinguish the world, ideologies of hate and anger, forests being depopulated, risking the creation of new oxygen. We see abortion, infanticide, and genocide. Now, not wanting to continue is to paint such a gloomy picture regarding a document that starts out with joys and hopes, 
<laughs> I do want to show an over overreaching point, which is this kind of perspective leads the lay people smack into a problem. We all have the desire to become better Christians, but we don't have the time or the leisure available to do so. The laity has to spend all its time working in a secular world, and there's no time or place to become intimate with God. This is the world of duality. It lies to Christians and perpetuates the general, in general, the Greek thoughts that the Gnostic heresies in the third century onward. And Dr. Messa says, speaking of duality, what is crucial about it is the way it misleads Christians about the holiness and the way of living the Christian life. <laughs> Moreover, it draws people away from taking their earthly life seriously. We tend to forget a very important account in the creation stories in Genesis. St starting with Genesis 129, God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it, to be your food. And to all the animals of the land, and all the birds in the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. Here is the critical verse. Perhaps. <laughs> God looked at everything he had made, and he found it very good. Evening came, and morning followed the sixth day. God didn't just say it was good. He said it was very good. This, along with the orthodox reputation of the general Gnostic philosophy, should open our eyes a bit to the scriptural look at the world. God was, in, the, the reputation says, God was incarnated in a body in this world as Jesus Christ. God cannot do or be evil as he is full of love and good. Jesus was God, proven through the scriptures, and therefore the human body and the world cannot be evil. However, the Gnostic beliefs and its basic duality still persist. This duality of thinking holds us back from full communion with God. Full communion with God can be achieved here on earth, but we need a refreshment in our way of thinking. How do we break ourselves out of the spiritual duality in which we find ourselves? The vocation of the laity is not, repeat, not lower than that of the religious or priests, deacons, or even bishops. Remember, regardless of our vocation, those of you, well, most of you here, well, it's possible except for Thea, <laughs> we'll remember this. <laughs> I don't remember anything. <laughs> Question is, why did God make you? And the answer, God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. Now, Father Moises answered this question exactly the same way that you and I did. We still, he still does and he will do until we are happy in heaven with God. So I mentioned earlier that we need to take a fresh look at things, break this out of our Western way of looking at things. Now, God even Spess starts out, of course, with an introduction, naturally. Then it proceeds to build up mankind, as we mentioned earlier. It begins with exploring human dignity, and this is the same explore, uh, approach which at lay, minister, lay uh, spirituality, which is uh, approached by Dr. Messa. This is why it is a fundamental way of looking at the teachings of the Constitution, as well as growing in our own spirituality. We want to know God, love God, and serve God. And this is exactly what the Vatican II documents did for us. We have slowly begun unpacking these ideas for 50 years. We are celebrating those documents this year as well as one of the gifts which the documents brought, brought to us, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But that's not all. So many of our great encyclicals and documents which we have come to know and cherish, Humanae Vitae, Familius Consortio, John Paul II's series of homilies which made up the theology of the body, would most likely not have seen the light of day without breaking open the lay spirituality proclaimed in Gaudium et Spes. Taken in the entirety, the four cardinal documents, De Verbum, Lumen Gentium, Sacrosanctum, Concilium, and Gaudium et Spes, make the church and us, the laity, 
the fullness which we can be. So let's impact that spirituality of the laity as envisioned by the Council of 50 years ago. Let us start to explore this by going back to the basics, as Father explained a bit ago at Bontes. Back to the beginning, back to the fundamental realities. So let us start where the word, word laity came from. If we're going to go back to fundamental realities, you've got to go back right to the origin of the word. Laity comes from the Greek word laikos. It means belonging to the people. It's not giving any levels or calling de definitions of how the uh, world can be viewed. It's not like the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. Its basis is the professional word. Over the years, it certainly may have taken on some pejoratives. No question about that. But in reality, the word itself, when taken from biblical sense, as well as what is said in the documents of the church, it actually takes on the meaning of honor. Let's listen to what it says in Lumen Gentium. Christ instituted the new covenant in his blood by calling together a people made up of Jew and Gentile, making them one, not according to the spirit. This was the new people of God for those who believe in Christ and who are reborn, not from a perishable, but an imperishable seed. They're, fi they're finally established as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people who in times past were not people, but are now the people of God. Now, of course, some of this was taken from 1 Peter. But you can see that the church has now stood up and taken away any doubt of any separation, any levels between the religious and the laity. We are there. It reiterates for us all to hear that everyone, Jew and Gentile, which is all of us, is part of the royal priesthood, the holy nation, and have been purchased. Purchased by whom? Jesus Christ. The point was, the laity belong every part, uh, every part of the people of God. But this gets watered down when we have a dualistic viewpoint. Dr. Messa says it best when he says, the fundamental reality of Christian is that of belonging to a people of the covenant. To call oneself the laity, by Apos, is to claim own the membership with the people who God has gathered to himself in Christ. Mm. This is the message that we need to be reminded. Now the reason for this reminder is a simple one, one which many people have forgotten. It's simply to remind the people of God that they are church. The church is not some organization which we belong to of common interest. The church comes from a call to covenant relationship as a community. No one can be church alone. Remember when two or get more are gathered? It has pleased God, however, to make men holy and uh, save them, not merely as individuals without any mutual bonds, but by making them into a single people, a people which acknowledges him in truth and serves him in holiness. Again, that's from Lumen Gentium. So we see that the covenant with God is what has given rise and formed the church. But now we must move forward with our Advantes look, now with the church and its purpose. Now it's agreed, now this is agreed, that the formative moment in Israel's experience, and that means the formative moment for the church, is the meeting between Yahweh and Israel at Mount Sinai. We need not worry about exactly what happened, or how it occurred, or any other, other details, but at that moment we can be sure that Israel made a covenant with Yahweh. He became their Lord and Israel became his people. They left the mountain with an understanding as well as an identity. They were Israel. They were a people, they were a group. Now, for whatever reason, the chosen way in which uh, talking about this relationship between Yahweh and Israel is in the political way of talking. Of course, we're talking here of the original meaning of political, uh, the Greek polis, which means city, the public order in contrast to the private realm. It relates and speaks of public order. Regardless of how else we, uh, any of us can choose to speak, it always the normal way of speaking about church is the political way. It has to be in the public order. It does not remain private and secret, uh, secrets known only to a few. 
It's open. It's public. Now, it's interesting to note that the type and content of the covenant in this Bible